Did it go on to mute? That's it. Okay. <clears throat> right, good evening. It's an honor to be here and to um, just be sharing the message of God's unconditional love, His mercy and His grace, the gospel of Jesus, not the, uh, the gospel of man, the gospel of what we must do for God, but the message of what God has done for us. That is what the gospel is all about. You know, the gospel can exist without your contribution. Isn't that wonderful? It is, uh, the, the gospel is, is, is a historic event, something that has already happened. Isn't that beautiful? And we are just declaring what has already happened in Jesus Christ and how it influences you. Let's just pray together. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you for your unconditional love. I want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. I want to thank you that as I minister your word, I can do it under the influence of your spirit to just teach it in such a way that many can believe it and have their minds at rest at the integrity of God. Thank you for that, my Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I want to just say for, to all those that watch by the web, just be a web evangelist for a moment and just take that link and quickly share it on Facebook so that another hundred people can just log in and hear this gospel. Amen. Uh, you know what's nice about a, a link, sending a link, is nobody is forced to do it. So you can just quickly do it and, and more people can, can hear the, the message. And don't be ashamed to show other people you are listening to grace, man. Thank you, Jesus. Man, many people know you're listening in secret to the grace message. So just thank you, Lord. <laughs> Amen. I love, the, I love the internet. And uh, it, it gives people the opportunity to really go out and study and listen to so many different, you know, preachers about the gospel of grace and, and to see their lives change. Now, um, tonight I'm going to minister on um, the law of God <clears throat> and what that really is. But before I get into that, I would like to just share something about tithing. Um, and I believe this is going to bless you. Now, I'm just going to read. We don't, we, we're going to look at the verse just now on the screen. But I first want to read something from, from Deuteronomy about the tithe. <clears throat> you know, I just believe that when it comes to finances, if you are in the law when it comes to money, you are in the law in 95% of everything in your life. You cannot, if you want to come here, you come to church, you, you, you give money. You go to the shop, you give money. What you drive, where you stay, what you wear, everything is determined by how much money you have and what you think about money. Your peace in this life, most of the time, is determined by money. You might say, but it's not like that. No, let's take all your money away and see the struggle that comes to your mind, you know, and, 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 and what, what comes to your heart. So money plays a very big role in our lives. And if we've got a wrong understanding of finances, when it comes to grace, you can be in grace in a small area of your life, but the rest of life is just this underlying stress, this underlying condemnation, um, you know, and, and you will sort of think and reason from that, and you will just find it's difficult to have peace in this life. So I want to just um, study a, a, a touch on the tithe, because, um, you know, I, I don't think we've, we've, we've studied this thing in the right perspective. Now, if you look at anything in the Bible, you must see Jesus. If you don't see Jesus, you have not seen the Word of God. Right. The simple as that. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He was the Word that became flesh and showed forth the Father. The, Jesus is the Word on tithing. Jesus is the word on the Old Testament. Jesus is the word about your holiness. Jesus is the word about your righteousness. Jesus is the word about your salvation. Jesus is the word about your redemption. Jesus is the word about sowing and reaping. And if you don't preach Jesus in the tithe, you're not preaching the word of God concerning the tithe. Isn't that a, a, a very simple, basic principle from where we can interpret Scripture? Right, so let's go to Deuteronomy um, uh, 14, and we're going to read from verse 21. Deuteronomy 14, and we read from verse, let's read from verse 22. 14, verse 22. It says, Thou shalt truly tithe 
all the increase of thy seed that the field brings forth year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of your corn and of your wine and of your oil and of the firstling of your herb and of the flocks, that you may learn to fear or to have reverence to the Lord your God always. Okay, now, uh, when we go to Malachi 3, just before we turn there, we cannot look at Malachi 3 and what the tithe is in Malachi 3 outside of looking at the origin or where the tithe comes from. You know, when we go to Malachi 3, there was something said, and it was said that the tithe did not come to the storehouse. Now, if you want to go and see what was the original law, how the tithe had to be used, you go to Deuteronomy. And now what it says here in Deuteronomy, it says you shall bring a tithe of all your, the, the increase of your field and flock and wine and oil, and then you bring the tithe to the place that God has said, and then you will eat your tithe there. Okay. That's what it says. You see it there? So you will eat your tithe. The tithe was not something that was given. It was something that was eaten. Now that's very important. You need, you need to understand that. Now let's read on. <clears throat> Verse 23, just again. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of the corn and of the wine and of the oil, of the firstling of the herd and of the flock, and that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way be too long for you, like if the storehouse or the place was too long for you, so that you are not able to carry it, or so that you are not able, um, or if the place be too Far for you, which the Lord thy God has choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God has blessed you, then shall you turn it into money. So this was not even allowed to be, become money in the first instance. If it was too far, then you can make it money. Before that you cannot. And you'll bind the money in your hand, and you shall go to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And you shall bestow the money for whatsoever your soul lusts after. For oxen, for sheep, for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever your soul desire, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your whole household. Now isn't that awesome? So what will you do with the tithe? You will make it money if the place is too far, and then when you come to the place where the, where, where the, where the tithe had to be eaten, you will turn that money into whatsoever your soul lusts after. Okay? Because the tithe is whatever you desire. Amen. And that you can partake of whatever you desire. It, that is what the tithe is. It says you'll take the tithe, you'll turn it into money. The money you will be, be, bestow for whatsoever your soul desires. Listen to what it says there. Whatsoever. I mean, be it oxen, sheep, strong drink, wine, whatever. And then you'll eat it and you'll drink it in remembrance of God. Now we get to Malachi chapter 3. Let's go to Malachi 3.10. It says, <coughs> It says, Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. Now, just before we read that, I want to just give a little bit of background. Malachi is a prophet. Do you agree with me? Yes. Now, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. prophets. So, in other words, this Malachi was prophesying about Jesus. If you go to Malachi 3 verse 1, if you can just go there quickly. You can just on the side, just scroll it up. That's it. It says, Behold, I sent my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, who does that talk about? John the Baptist. So here he's prophesying about the coming of the Lord. He's prophesying a New Testament prophecy, and if you go and read the rest of the verses, you will find he was actually saying that the priesthood that there was, was not good enough, and they could not do what had to be done. And then he had a big thing against the old priesthood, and this was the big thing he had against them. And we go to verse 10. This was the biggest thing he had against them. He says, um, let's go to verse 9. Okay, he says, um, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Uh, it, it, now, you just took it out of the way. Okay, okay but you see this in the tithe and the offering, verse 9. Even this whole nation. Bring ye, verse 10, verse 1, all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be meat 
in my house. And prove me herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Okay, so he says here, there's something very important that in the type and shadow, God had a problem with. There was no food in the storehouse that somebody could eat in remembrance of God so that the curse could be broken over his life. Because a tithe was something you had to eat in remembrance of God. So God had a problem with these Old Testament people and he said, listen, you're not bringing the tithe. They did, did not t take the, 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 the food, they did not come to the place that God has said, and they did not eat it and have a party in remembrance of the goodness of God. They did not do it. So God was upset. So he said, listen, if the true tithe can come to the storehouse, then there will be meat in my house, and people can come and eat of that meat, and the curse can be broken over their life. Now what does the Bible say about the flesh of Jesus? My flesh is meat indeed. <laughs> so the, the conclusion is, Jesus is your tithe. He is that that needed to come to the storehouse in order for, for you to go and eat and that whatsoever your soul lusts after. Now, mankind, the moment Adam sinned, man, was, man felt a void inside him and he lusted after the very being of God. Now, we've, we've taken that into many other things and substituted stuff for what we actually desire. And what we actually desired was the very being of God. And Christ was that flesh, that very being of God, that we can eat and partake of and be set free. So he was saying, if the true tithe can come to the storehouse, there will be meat my people can eat. Now, if I ask you, where's your first fruit offering? You'll say, or let me put it this way. If I ask you, where's your sacrificial offering? You will say, no, but Jesus is my sacrificial offering. If I said, where's the scapegoat? You will say, no, but Jesus is there. And so can I go through all the types of sacrifices, but if I go to, um, we, we, you can just move this one back again, I'm, I want to still show something there. So if, you, if we go through all these sacrifices, we'll say, no, but Jesus is there. But when we come to the tithe, we hit for our, for our pocket, for our wallet. How does that make sense? It is not a consi consistent interpretation of the word. So Jesus Christ is the tithe. Now, just look at the, uh, uh, chapter, 10, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse, um, verse, verse 10 there. It says, bring ye all the tithe. You see the word ye there is in brackets, uh, eight, number 853. That is the Hebrew word uh, uh, which cannot be pronounced. Actually, it can actually not even be uh, um, translated at all. Um, it comes from a root word which means an omen. Do you know what an omen is? An omen is a sign of a futuristic event. Okay? So that was a word, that word is used the most in the Bible. It's used over 7,000 times in the Bible and cannot be translated. It consists out of two Hebrew characters, Olive and Tav, which in, translated in Greek is the two characters Alpha Omega. Isn't that awesome? And it's written in the accusative tense, which points to the thing that is just after it. So this is what it says. It says, bring the Alpha and the Omega, which is all the tithe, into the storehouse. So in other words, Jesus was all that had to be paid for you. Jesus was everything that had to come so there would be enough substance and meat in the house of God so that you can eat it. Now, what is eat in, the, uh, in, in Bible terms? You know, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I mean, they didn't go up to a tree and eat the apple. And I always thought, man, if they just didn't eat that apple. I don't know how it got to an apple anyway. Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> the, when we eat the flesh of Jesus, how do we eat the flesh of Jesus? 
We believe on Him. Amen. How did they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? They believed that dong, uh, dong, wrong doctrine. <laughs> Listen, I'm Afrikaans, you know. <laughs> so, <clears throat> they, be they believed the wrong doctrine. Because they believed the wrong doctrine, they died. So here it says that God will bring meat if the true, if the Alpha and the Omega, the omen, the, the sign of a futuristic event, what he was saying is if that futuristic event can manifest, then there will be meat, something that people can believe in, and the curse will be broken from them. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house, and prove me herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you, that word you was translated wrongly, it, that word cannot be translated, translated. If the, in the Thais definition it clearly says, cannot be translated in English. Okay, Thais, unfortunately not here. But there it says, and if I will not open you, Alpha Omega again, which is the windows of heaven, so he says, if the tithe, which is Jesus, can come and prove me that if Jesus comes, if I will not open up Jesus, which is the very windows of heaven, unto you. And where did he open him up? On that cross. <laughs> the veil was torn. Jesus was the window through which we looked into the heavens and we saw God Almighty. I thank God for the tithe. People ask me, do you believe in the tithe? I say, hallelujah, I wouldn't have been saved if it wasn't for the tithe. <laughs> Amen. I don't know how we connect this even with money in a church. Now, I'm not against giving. I'm absolutely for the fact that people give, and I'm absolutely for the fact that from eating of Jesus, the very life of God is born into us, and we, we find generosity coming forth in us. Amen. And we don't frustrate the grace of God. So, because the Bible says, by the grace of God, the churches in Macedonia gave abundantly. And we don't frustrate that grace. So, I mean, I will just be frustrating the very influence of God upon the hearts of people concerning generosity if I am so foolish to go and preach against giving. I mean, that's just against the very nature of God. So, I'm not against giving. God is not against giving. We are not preaching. I'm not preaching this about tithing in rebellion against an old system. Because let me tell you something. Rebellion against the Lord does not equal grace. Will I say it again? Rebellion against the Lord does not equal grace. So the fact that you're angry with the law system and angry with a church that you've been hurt at and angry and angry and now out of that anger we are, we are studying the Bible from the foundation of anger. We are studying the Bible from the foundation of the effect of the law and with a law mindset we try and interpret scriptures. And you just see law, law, law. And out of that is no peace, out of that is no joy, out of that is just a lot of hurt. Amen. So here he says, let's read it again, bring Jesus, which is all the tithe, into the storehouse, that there might be something that people can believe in, in my house, and prove me, herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open Jesus, the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy Aleph Tav, Jesus, which is the fruit of your, and whatever the next verse should be. <laughs> Amen. So what, what is our fruit? How does God see our fruit? Jesus is our fruit. <laughs> Amen. So I want to tell you that God says, He will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now what is that which devoured our fruit? It's the law. Romans chapter 7 clearly states that flesh under the law manifests sin and the good that you want to do, the good fruit that there is in you, cannot manifest for there's something that devours it. But when we can partake of the true tithe, which is Jesus, we'll find God resisting sin in you. 
It's not you resisting sin. The resisting that we do is we resist the false belief. And when we stand in the true gospel, we find God forbidding sin. You know what the Bible says, shall we continue to sin now that we are in grace? It says, no, God forbids. The word forbid means cease to exist. God, now that we are in grace, is not us trying to fight sin. It is God resisting sin in us. Hallelujah. Oh man. Now well, that was just for free. Let's, let's just get into the word for tonight. <laughs> Amen. Right, I said I'm going to talk about the new law. Amen. <laughs> How long have I been preaching? <laughs> I said in my studio I preached 25 minutes. <laughs> Not here, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Listen, I always preach as if I will never be invited again. <laughs> you, you don't know. That, I mean, the, the, the pastor might, you know, decide to go to another, con another country, another place, and the new pastor might not like me. So you always preach as if you're never going to get an opportunity again. <laughs> right. We want to talk about the new law written on the heart of man. Now, you know, I always thought that the new law written on the heart of man was God coming and um, taking the Ten Commandments and making it part of my life. Writing that on my heart. Where it was always written on stones, now it's going to put it in my very being and where I always under the, under the law... You know, just wanted to do bad. Now I will want to do good. Because I'm under grace. And I always used to preach in the beginning. I would say, listen man, grace is not a license to sin because now I want to do good. And that's not true. That is an absolute watered down false way of looking at it. That's not what God will do. If the Ten Commandments is called the ministration of death, how will God now come and write that on your heart and kill you? <laughs> now, he cannot. He cannot. If God in the Garden of Eden said, now, now let me just make this clear. <clears throat> I don't believe that, this is, this is my opinion, if you differ from this, you can differ from me and God, that's okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I, I don't believe God gave the law. God wrote the law down and gave it in written format. Right. But Adam implemented the law. And I want to define the law. You get the law and you get commandments. The law is the principle of I am not, I need to become. Mm -hmm. Commandments are the things you need to do to become. Okay. Every church has got a, every, most churches are under the law. They've just got different commandments. The one says, no, our commandment is, is you must sit very still and not smile or move and be quiet. <laughs> then you say, oh, that church is under the law, I'm leaving that church. You go to the other church which says, you should raise your hands, you must raise it. Yeah. Praise God, so that the anointing can drop. It's, just, it's the same law, just different commandments. So that was the ten commandments which God in His wisdom gave for the purpose to show you the, that because people didn't think they had sin. They didn't think they needed a Savior. They knew nothing. They just knew, well, this is how we live. And then that law came and made sin more sinful. Made it manifest. So here was something, a law, Given, God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat thereof, that tree will minister death to you. Now the ministration of death was then taken and written down on stones. And then given to man in written format. That ministration of death, which was in the Garden of Eden was actually, now this is very technical, but please just um, try and f uh, uh, follow me here, was a thought pattern of Satan. If you go and study types of Satan in the Bible, <clears throat> you will find that Lucifer was an earthly king. He was the king of Babylon. He wasn't a, a spiritual being, he was an earthly king. Go and study it out. Which was the king of Babylon. Now we know Babylon stands for the kingdom of the devil. 
Now, he was the king of that. And out of that types and shadows, we can see what kind of being it was and what caused his fall. And the same way the king of Tyrus, and in the same way, uh, um, the head of the Egyptians, what was, in, was it Pharaoh? The same way with Pharaoh. Now, there's a scripture in the Bible where, where God talks, about, talks to Pharaoh and send a prophet to Pharaoh and tell him why he's falling. He said, and then listen to this, he says, Pharaoh, you were in the garden of God. Eden. He says, you were a tree planted next to the water. And you became very high, much higher than the other trees. And your branches were standing all over the other trees. So he was higher, he was a ruling over them, he was bigger. And then it says, and then you started to boast in the length of your branches. And you forgot that it was the river that made you so high. So why did this, this Pharaoh, which was in the Garden of Eden, fall? Because he was not pointing, he was not finding who he is in the source, which is the Spirit or God, but he started to define himself in his ability. That caused his fall. And that is the very thing that causes the fall of Satan. He came and took that thought pattern and sold it to Adam and Eve. Look at the good in your life. You are not what God says you are. You are what you do. You know, a little bit technical, but look at this. When Adam and Eve was in the garden, they were like God. And, and I believe they knew that they were like God. They weren't mistaken about it. They knew it. And after they, they, when Satan came to them, he tempted them with this. He said, you can be like God by knowing good and evil. Now they were like God by God making them that way. So they were tempted not to have a higher level or to be like God. They were tempted to be like God on a different foundation. They were tempted to be like God on the foundation of, I know the good, I know works or evil, and on the basis of knowing all these wonderful things, I will say, I am like God because of these things. It's like uh, uh, Jesus when he was in the desert, Satan came to him, Jesus was already the Son of God, Jesus knew he was the Son of God, God confirmed he was the Son of God, and then he said to him, find your sonship in this, your ability. Take the stone, make it a bread. Look at what you can do, and then you say, I am not the Son of God because God made me like this, but I am the Son of God because of the length of my branches. Okay. So at that, that's, that's where the whole law thing comes from. So now, why will God go, and in the fulfillment of the law, and in Jesus, take that law and write it on your heart? He's just going to kill you. He's trying to get man away from that. Now, I always thought that the fulfillment of the law was taking the law together in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Now, the, when they came to Jesus and they asked Jesus, which is the greatest law? He says, love the, Lord with all your, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. That's the greatest law. The greatest commandment in the law. Now, what does that mean? That's the thing that will kill you the quickest. Isn't it? So, what is the most powerful, the greatest commandment in the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your neighbor as yourself. Now, I always thought that was now the fulfillment of the law. We only had ten, now God made it down to two simple things. Just love the Lord your God with all your heart, your neighbor as yourself. Easy to do. That is just called death in shorthand. <laughs> Amen. If we go to Romans 2, let's make sure I've got the right verse there. Romans 2 verse 12. Romans 2 and verse 12. It says, <clears throat> For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law 
shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, um, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. So what is he saying there? He's saying that the Gentiles, even before Jesus came, had the law written on their heart. And that, by that, they will, be, they will die. That's what he says. They had the law written on their heart, and because of that, they sin without the law. What law? The written law. So they had the law written on their hearts. The Jews had the law written on their hearts and on stones. So then, he, then Paul comes and he tries to show that all people are sinners. Because if all people can be sinners and Jesus could take away the sin of the world, then the whole world can be innocent before God. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? So his argument was to get everybody guilty. Because Jesus came to take guilt away. So that Jesus could be the savior of every man. That was his argument. So he says... The law was already written on the hearts of the Gentiles. By that, they're going to die and stand guilty before God. So why will God take that law and write it on your heart? It has already been written on the hearts of... Adam came and wrote the law of do to become on the hearts of man. Jesus Christ came to write the law of God on your heart. And you would like to know, what is the law of God? Now the Bible says in Hebrews 8 and in Hebrews 9, it says, After those days, I will write my law on their hearts. So there will be certain days, and then after those days, I will write my law on their heart. So there will be days when the law of Adam, the law of works, will be written on the hearts of people, and then God will end it, and after those days, then God will write His law on our hearts. Now, a law, a, a, a law is a basic principle by which things function. Like you get the law of gravity, you get many other laws by which things function. So you get the law of God. Now, how does the law of God work and what is this law of God? Let's go to um, Psalms, Psalm 40. So we're going to look at the principle by which God does things. Psalm 40. And look at the law of God that you will write on your heart. Now, remember, and I'm sure you know this, the, a heart is not the physical pump in your body that's referred to in the Bible. The heart is your belief system. How you believe. Okay? How you believe. Another thing that I recently discovered is that the word spirit... I always just thought it is just a wind or water or something like that. But the word spirit talks about if you're in the spirit, what does that mean? Spirit means a, 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 a basic principle or a vital principle that is animated. Okay. So you know these anim animation movies. That is just a drawing. But they are actually animating a truth. So there's a truth that finds its life in that drawing. So when you're in the spirit is, there is a truth that finds its life in you. So when we are in the spirit of Christ, then the vital principle of Christ as your representative and as your life is animated in you. Then you're in the spirit. In the spirit doesn't mean I'm spooky. In the spirit doesn't mean I'm weird. In the spirit means I am in the place where the spirit of Christ, the spirit of the anointed one, or the basic principle of Christ, God became a human being, and when he became a human being, then God made peace, then there was peace amongst men, and peace between us and God. Now the word peace does not mean, well, I'm not angry. The word peace means... And this is Bertie Blitz's definition for peace. It is the emotion in the heart of a person 
that knows he's not indebted. Because the word peace means prosperity in the Greek. It means prosperity. Why does it say prosperity? I believe, man, if you owe people money and you can't pay, you don't have peace. But if you've got prosperity and more than enough and you're not indebted at all, that's the emotion of peace. So Jesus came, he became a human being. That is the whole spirit of Christ. The spirit of God is the basic principle of God indwelling human flesh and living in you. When you're in that belief, you are in the spirit. And the very dunamis or power of God manifests that being inside you. Hallelujah. So when we talk about the law, we talk about that basic principle, that vital principle, that spirit. Now you get the spirit of the world, or the spirit of Christ, or the spirit of the Antichrist. That's all principles by which people think and believe, which is living or manifesting in their lives. That's all that it is. Right, Psalm 40. I'm going to read a prayer of Jesus. Verse 5. This is Jesus. Just hear Jesus here. He says, Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto you. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Now, look at Jesus. Jesus gets a revelation. You're saying, but Barty, did Jesus get the revelation? Yes. Jesus read the scriptures. I, I believe that <clears throat> Mary told Jesus, listen, your father wasn't Joseph. Your father is God. You are the Messiah. The angels appeared and explained everything. And, and at the age of 12, he already knew that God was his father. And he read the Bible from the perspective of God is my father. And he was reading all these sacrifices and everything. And he was wondering, you know, I wonder why my father wants all these sacrifices. I wonder why, you know, he's, he, was, he was talking about, what, wonder, why was Jonah, you know, and, uh, 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 um, in the belly of the fish and Noah and all those things. And he was reading this and he wanted to understand it. And then listen to this. He heard the very thoughts of God. He started to hear the basic principle of God. He started to hear how God thinks. And this is what he said. He said, Lord, these thoughts that I hear from you, they are too wonderful. They are marvelous. I don't know how I can ever tell all people the wonderful things you are thinking. And then he, he, preached, he talks from a human perspective towards us. Then the next verse, verse 6. Listen to what he heard about God's thoughts. It says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears as thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering as thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it's written of me. Now listen to what he says. He says, God, I heard your thoughts. And when I heard your thoughts, I said, oh my God, these sacrifices, I thought, God, you wanted these people to sacrifice so that you can do something for them. But now I realize that you don't even want them to do these things. All these sacrifices, the, the volume of this book speaks of me. Yeah. It speaks of me. You're actually talking about me being sacrificed for them. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. So what is the law that he's talking about here? We're going to get to that now. There's a law. God doesn't want your sacrifice. He wants Jesus to come so that you can be saved by Him. Right. That goes on. It says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yes, thy law is written in my belief. I'm believing your law. Verse 9. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Um, lo, I have not retrained my lips, O Lord thy God. No. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. Now, you look at the chapter 10 in the beginning, and then we go back to, the end, uh, uh, to uh, 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 verse 10 in the beginning, and then we go to verse 8. It says, verse 7, it's written in, in, in the book of the law of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Verse 10, so the law is in the heart of Jesus. I have not hid thy righteousness 
within my heart. So the law of God is in the heart of Jesus. But he said, I didn't keep it for myself. I did not hide your righteousness from the great congregation. So what is the law of God? It's how righteous God is. Amen. Now let's, he goes on and explains that law. He says, I have declared thy faithfulness. I have declared thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. So he, he comes and he declares the very law or basic principle of God that God has towards people. He says, God, I read your Bible. I read the physical law of Moses. Then I came to the revelation. You don't want people to do these things. These things speak about me. It speaks about me. So your law is actually, so I am now declaring your righteousness, what the good thing done, the good thing that you are doing to people. I'm declaring your faithfulness. He's declaring the law of God. The law of God written on your heart is how faithful God is to you. That's the law He will write on your heart. Amen. He's not going to write on your heart the Ten Commandments. Bless God. God, if God, let me tell you, God has got no right to do that. Because of Jesus. Jesus fulfilled that and it passed away. For God to do that, he'll have to, uh, uh, he'll have to function in the spirit of Satan or with the basic principle of Satan, which is to define you outside of him. I hope that's not too complicated. And God's not working for the devil. The devil said, take this law, make that your belief system. Now, since when's God now going to work for the devil? He's not going to work for the devil. Now, I want to tell you, even if I say this, I can just know that it shakes religion. But bless God. The Bible says, once more He shakes not only a, a, a heaven but earth as well. He shakes the whole thing. He shakes religion with the message of His unconditional love. So He comes, He says, my law is what? Your righteousness. And then He explains His righteousness. I've declared thy faithfulness. Now, if you go and read 1 Corinthians, it talks about faithfulness. God's faithfulness cannot be defined in, uh, well, I, I, I will not be angry for, with you for one or two days. That's a very shallow way of defining God's faithfulness. When something is faithful to another thing, um, it is when that one, if, if you talk about real faithfulness, is when they are in harmony or when things becomes one with each other. So God's faithfulness to mankind is seen and described vividly in Jesus. When God became a human being and mankind became uh, uh, holy and forgiven and righteous, got the right through Christ, and Jesus was raised and sat at the right hand of the Father in human form, God was united with man and made man alive. Now that life there is God's faithfulness to man. For God to stop to be faithful to you, Jesus needs to die. Amen. The faithfulness of God is described in God being, becoming one with man. Hallelujah. That is the faithfulness of God. I declare thy salvation. How you bring forth salvation. How you have saved all of man from being saved by the law. Amen. Jesus Christ redeemed all of mankind. Now another word for redemption is to buy back, or if you want to use the word salvation there, you use it this way. We have all been saved from being saved by the law. Isn't that wonderful? So we are declaring the salvation of God over people. We are declaring the innocence of people. Because Jesus took away the sin of the world. So that they can believe this and be saved from the lie 
and its effect in their lives. So by faith we've got access into this. Right, let's go on. It says, Thy salvation, I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Now I just want to touch on loving kindness. What is loving kindness? Loving kindness, um, I think it's in, in, in the Webster's, it comes from two words, loving, which means, this is, this is in the Hebrew, loving, which means a strong desire, and kindness, which means the following. It's a character trait of a person, the personality of a person that delights in contributing to the happiness of others by granting their wishes, supplying their wants, and lifting their distresses. That's loving kindness. So God says, Jesus said, I did not hide your law, your principle, by which you have relationship with us from the great congregation, but I declared your strong desire, which is found in your person, to be good to people, where you delight in contributing to their happiness by granting their wishes, supplying their wants, and lifting their distresses. The loving kindness of God. So when God comes and He says, I will write my law on your heart. What He will do by the Holy Spirit is He will remind you of everything you freely received in Christ. Because by reminding you of what you freely received in Christ, you will find that it will contribute to your happiness. It will lift your distresses. You know, the Bible says, come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden. The word labor there in the Greek, that works hard. Heavy laden means the following. That is overburdened with the practicalities of religion. So if you work very hard and you're overburdened with the practicalities of, re of religion, you can come to Jesus. So if you've been working very hard at religion in church or in some Muslim faith or some whatever, you can come to Jesus and you can take a real rest from your hard work. For He is in declaring and God's whole vision with, with preachers, with the Holy Spirit and everything is to write His law on your heart. The vital principle which will be animated in your life. I want to tell you, outside of you believing this, and being persuaded of God's love, you will find that even if this principle is true, there will be no manifestation. And I want to tell you, I know I'm married to my wife. I'm carrying the ring. I've got the proof here. But I tell you, it's much better to feel her and to talk to her, to hold her, and to spend time with my kids. Than just to know that I am married. Just to know that there is a contract. I want to make use of it. I want to just end off with this. <clears throat> when God, you know, God's number one vision is not for you just to bear fruit, my friends. We, was, we got so fruit orientated, works orientated. That we missed the law of God. You hear what I'm talking about? Law. The very law of God. We missed the basic principle from where He functions. His loving kindness and goodness. Which brings forth fruit in our life. You know, if I... Um, I've said it many times, but this, to me this is such a good example of this. You know, if I'm away from home for, say, two months or three months, I'm going to preach in the Africa bush. And I just got married and... And, and I left home and I come back after three months and my wife says to me, and I mean, we got married. We, we say, man, hallelujah, we married. We've got a vision. One day we're going to have kids, the whole thing. And I come back after three months and my wife says, my hubby, I've got good news. I'm two weeks pregnant. <laughs> and I say to her, now, what have you done? You've ruined our, our relationship. You've ruined everything. The ministry is ruined. Everything is finished. What have you done? And she says, why are you so angry? I thought our vision is that we'll have children. I'm bearing fruit here. You see, we, the, the vision is not that she will bear fruit. The vision is she will bear my fruit. 
Amen. God's vision is not for you to live holy, man. God's vision is for His love to bring forth His nature in you. He wants you to bear His fruit. You know, when Abraham uh, uh, made Ishmael, and then after that he had Isaac, then God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, which was Isaac. Now, I mean, Abraham didn't only have one son. We know that for sure. He had Isaac as well. I mean, Ishmael as well. But God didn't even see that. Didn't count that as a fruit. Although, man, how do you know if Ishmael could not run faster than Isaac? Maybe he was prettier. Who knows? Doesn't, doesn't matter how pretty or how smart or whatever Ishmael is. Ishmael is not born from God. Not born from the promise. It's not born from God's principle of promise. God's principle of I give to you for free. It was born from another principle. Even if, it, if, if Ishmael also had two hands, two eyes, two ears, a healthy body and everything, he's not born from God. And the vision is not to have a life that looks like the life of God. The vision is to have the life of God in us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, that you love us so much. Let's close our eyes. Father, I want to just thank you that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that there are so many people out there that are so bound by religion and death that needs the salvation. And I thank you, Lord, that we can preach this, that people can hear it and be saved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've redeemed us so that we can preach your message unto salvation. You love us so much. Father, the people that sit here tonight are so special. Lord, you love them so much. You love all of us. And thank you that you have not declared your love in simple words like, I love you. But you've declared your love by giving Jesus as the propitiation for our sins. You bound the strong man called the law and sin. And thank you, Lord, that you are plundering the house, declaring your kingdom has come. Hallelujah. I just declare every person here as healed. I declare every person over the internet, over the web, that's watching me right now, if there's any sickness in your body, any poverty that is threatening you, any lie that's threatening you, I declare to you in the name of Jesus that Jesus is your prosperity. He is your blessing. He is whatsoever you, you, you desire. And you can eat His flesh. You can just say, I believe in the fact that God became flesh and what is done for me. And rest your mind in the very integrity of God. Belief cannot be defined outside of rest. Thank you, Father, that we can rest in who you are. And thank you, Lord, that we are not preaching these messages to sound eloquent or anything like that, but we are just simply ministering this message because it's your truth and your passion for people is that intimacy and the revelation of what you've done. I thank you, Lord, that we are empowered to preach this gospel all over the world. In Jesus' mighty name, we yield our members unto your righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, maybe you are here for the very first time and you've never received this truth. You've never received Jesus as your Lord. What that means, what it means to receive Jesus as Lord, it means to receive Jesus as the one that served you with life that serves you with innocence. Maybe you have just received condemnation and judgment. Right now you can receive. Receive means to grab a hold of with a purpose to make use of. Grab a hold of. Make use of God's love for you by just saying, I'm not condemned anymore. I have been set free. I stand under the Lordship of Christ. You can write there where you are. You can just say that. From the depth of your heart. And receive the life God gave you in Christ. Awake unto this righteousness. In Jesus' mighty name.
Amen and amen. Hallelujah.